and it's my pleasure to introduce Tanoya today. We've been friends for a long time. I met Tanoya in my classroom. Fun fact, she was working at Galveston Bay Foundation and I was teaching at a high school in downtown Houston and we had kids draw pictures with poo on it. And I knew at that moment that Tanoya was a great educator. Uh, Tanoya comes to us actually from the Bahamas, which is a fun fact. And uh, before she worked at Galveston Bay Foundation, she was at the at Moody Gardens. I'm a little bit jealous, but now Tanoya has a really great gig. She is the manager of research evaluation and EE Blue at the North American Association for Environmental Education. And there are a million wonderful resources with the North American Association for Environmental Education. And she's gonna delve into just a few of those today. It's my honor my, and my privilege to introduce my friend Tanoya Thompson. Thanks so much, Alicia. I'm so excited to be here with you all today um, and uh, to be able to meet in this space during this time, uh, especially after the past couple of weeks that we've had. So I hope that as we go into this presentation that you sort of see this more as an open space conversation, um, a little bit of storytelling to hopefully wrap up an amazing conference that you all have had. The content has been really amazing. So I really am um, super appreciative and just super humbled to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. So I am going to share my screen. And full disclosure, because you all are educators, I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to um, try out a new presentation uh, setting. This is Canva. I'm not sure if uh, you all are familiar with Canva, but uh, it is actually one of my favorite resources and I'm excited to, to, to use this today because I think it's gonna be a really great um, tool for us to, to share and uh, to learn with. So today I'd love to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, I have a couple of links that I'll be putting in throughout the presentation. Feel free to jump onto those links or feel free to wait until afterwards. And I will also be providing a long list of links uh, to make sure that uh, you all can have access to everything that I speak about today. So we understand that all environmental education takes place on indigenous homelands. And for that reason, we're gonna take a moment to acknowledge. Um, if you could go ahead and put in the chat the native land link which Alicia just did, feel free to jump on there and find out where, which homelands you are on. I'm coming to you from Karankawa lands um, and in the Bahamas, since I'm originally from there, that's Teano and Lucayo lands. So we're gonna take a moment to do that. Thank you all for taking that moment with me. And I'm going to jump right in. So um, first off, I am going to start off with that. I'm hoping that this will be a full circle presentation. Um, my title is, is a little bit different, but that's because I feel like it's a great tie for pretty much everything that I've experienced recently. And then I've also gleaned from others' experiences. So it's called Through the Rocks Might Shift, or Though the Rocks Might Shift, excuse me. And I'm gonna talk to you about journey, journeying through moments that provoke change. And essentially what the significance of cultivating community and navigating our next steps together really truly mean. So again, my name is Tanoya Thompson. I'm the manager for research and evaluation at the North American Association for Environmental Education. Um, I'd love to know how you're doing today. Go ahead and let me know in the chat. And I'm looking back and forth because I have two screens, but I would just love to know, how are you doing this Friday? It is Friday. It's been a long couple of weeks. Um, you all have been learning lots of great content on top of doing your regular jobs or volunteering. How are you? I would love to just know um, how you're doing today in the chat. So go ahead and put that in there. For me, I'm the same. I see a lot of you busy, but loving everything. Absolutely. Um, I feel exactly the same way. I feel very thankful, but it has been a very busy first quarter of the year. So um, hopefully you all are looking forward to a nice weekend. We have some great weather here in Houston. I don't know where you might be in the, the state, but um, hopefully you have some good weather ahead to get outside. All right. 
So for this presentation, I have two hopes and a try. I have a hope to connect with you all in an authentic way. I have a hope to connect you to stories and resources that will support and encourage you. And I will try to do my very best to make this time on Zoom engaging and fun. So NAAAE is a wonderful organization that you all um, should definitely connect to if you haven't already. Uh, it's one of the those organizations that I wish that I had been connected to a little bit earlier on, but I got connected about four years ago, and um, it's it it feels still a little um, just not what I thought. I, I never thought that I would be working for a national nonprofit and I am so thankful for the opportunity and um, I just really believe in all of the resources that we offer. Um, our vision is a just and sustainable world where environmental and social responsibility drive individual, institutional, and community choices. And you will see that sprinkled and peppered throughout all of our resources. So I encourage you all, if you're not quite connected, um, definitely connect and I'll have some more information on how to do that throughout the presentation. So a little bit about me, Alicia did a great job of putting everything together of, of my path, but I did start off my career um, in marine biology. Uh, I started my career off at the age of 12 in the Bahamas. I started volunteering at a small aquarium and that basically just enhanced my um, love for everything that was underwater. And so I pursued that in undergrad and um, right after my undergrad, I had the privilege to work at Moody Gardens for over 12 years. And I worked with so many species of animals. Um, so my background is more concentrated on wildlife conservation, but um, over the past five to six years, I've really been on this exploration on how um, I would like my path to connect uh, to more impact within the field of environmental education and conservation. And so I uh, decided to go for my master's degree at Project Dragonfly um, at Miami University. And uh, on a trip, which I'll talk about in a little bit, decided I wanted to make a little bit of a shift. And so I uh, applied for the job at Galveston Bay Foundation where I was there for two and a half years. And that's where I met Alicia and some amazing people in our uh, area. And that organization works to conserve and protect Galveston Bay, which is Texas's largest estuary. I'll be talking a little bit more about that as well. And then um, through a series of really great events, I was able to meet Judy Browse, uh, the executive director for NAAAE at a leadership um, program that I was in. And um, through that connection, became more involved at the national level through an advisory council at NAAAE. And then about six months later, uh, because I was so plugged in and connected, and I, I had a conversation with Judy, and she said, you know, we actually have a position open, you should apply for it. And so I did, and um, the rest is history. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to work for such a great organization. The projects that I manage, which I'll dive into a little bit and also provide you all with links, are EE Blue, which is our five-year partnership that we have with NOAA, the National and Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Um, this partnership does everything from providing grants to supporting things like BWET, which is uh, the Bay and Watershed Educational Training. Um, we have a lot of other initiatives like supporting a youth summit, Basically, it's just a wonderful partnership with NOAA and I'm learning and growing so much. Um, EE Works, which is a um, project that connects with Stanford, UC Davis and University of Florida. We're basically working with research teams to take anecdotes, all of the wonderful stories that we all share about what we do in environmental education. And we're bringing evidence to that through um, data research and um, we are, are really excited for that and I'll speak more to that. EE Research, which is a really great tool if you're ever looking to dive into the research around EE. We have a free uh, research database that you can access on our website. 
And then EEVAL, which is a new and upcoming uh, project that I'm working on with Duke University. And we are building a culturally responsive evaluation portal. So as we are all learning, evaluation of our programs is really, really important. It's a huge component to the work that we do. And we're hoping that this resource will provide all of you and your teams and organizations like yours um, the, uh, the information and the support to evaluate your work. And so that is literally the smallest nutshell of everything that I, I do at NAAAA, but as we all know, within all of our jobs, there's so, so much more. So switching gears a bit, I want to take you to take about a minute, and uh, Canva is really great. It has this really neat timer that you can put into your presentation, um, but take a minute, and I just want you to think of three moments, and we're going to think wide scale, three moments where something changed for you. So just take three moments to just ponder. You don't have to put anything in the chat. Just think about it. Three moments. It could be something that is positive. It could be a negative. It could be a challenge. It could be a triumph. Um, I'm going to stop talking to give you about 30 seconds to think of those moments. Great, thank you for taking that time. So whatever those moments are for you, you realize that whether they were small or large, they made a huge change, a huge shift. And as we explore through today, I want you to take another moment to think of now bringing this wide scale thought of those moments and sort of bringing it into a, small, a, a more focused lens. Three moments that have shaped your today. And specifically, I wanna think about, I would love for you to think about um, this year. So March of 2020, a lot of things shifted for many of us. So let's think within the scope of this year. Can you think of three moments that have shaped your today? And I will go ahead and start the timer for another minute. We probably won't use the full minute for this, but take a minute and feel free to jot this down if you'd like, or just again, keep it in your head. We're not sharing anything in the chat. This is just for you. Great. Thank you all for taking that moment. And I hope that you have those three moments sort of surfaced at the top of your mind. Um, and we are really just taking that time to just sort of quickly, very quickly reflect on the year that we've had. And so for today's purpose, I want to talk to you about three moments that I identified. Um, over the course of the past four or five years. And I'm gonna dig into those moments one by one really quickly, and then we're gonna pull it all together. So for today's purpose, I wanna start off with a wonderful experience that I had in Bahia de Los Angeles in Mexico um, through Project Dragonfly, the graduate program that I was a part of. Um, I was a part of the Global Field Project, um, uh, the Go Global Field Program through Project Dragonfly. And within this program, you have online courses, but then you have three study abroad trips. And the very first trip that you take can either be in Baja or Belize. And these trips are essentially a way to connect with communities and community partners that are on the ground doing environmental education and conservation work. So in Bahia de Los Angeles, we uh, connected with the Vermilion Sea Institute, which is a science center um, in Bahia. They've done a lot of citizen science whale shark um, research as well as being um, a strong um, community-based conservation organization. And 
in Bahia de Los Angeles, I feel like it was probably one of the first times like within my life that I had a few moments to really sit and reflect and journal because that was all a part of the course. Um, I had, have been working nonstop um, since I you know, was 12 years old, volunteering, trying to do all the things, extra committees, um, you know, anything to advance my career. I always said yes to, to be a part of learning how to present, connecting to more communities and networks. I was a mom, I had a two year old at the time. Um, and I think Baja was just this wonderful space for me to really dig into and, and sort of think, what do I wanna do with my career? Where do I want it to go? And so I remember this moment specifically, this is actually a picture I took. We, were, we had just gotten done with this beautiful hike up a mountain that overlooked the Sea of Cortez. And we had a, a moment to sit and journal um, because that's a big part of the course. And um, I remember just feeling a major shift and knowing that something was gonna change, something was on the horizon. So put a pin in that. Moving into from 2016 to 2017, after my expiration in Baja, I decided to apply for a job with Galveston Bay Foundation. And so I was fairly settled into Galveston Bay Foundation and, um, you know, rolling within my, my degree program. And as many of you knew, Hurricane Harvey came about. And so I was learning this new wonderful project called the Galveston Bay Report Card, which was an, an annual report on the Bay um, to essentially educate communities around the Bay on uh, what was going on with the Bay, but it was, it was community driven. It was, um, put together through input from the community. And I started really diving into that and looking at this project as a really great digestible way to bring science communication in, but also to connect communities to the science communication. And then Harvey hit, and as we know, a lot of things changed and shifted. And when we have these big events, like we've all been through over the past couple of years, um, you recognize that that things shift and you, you recognize that things need to change. And so this was very different because the communities were coming together to support each other, um, to figure out what everyone needed. Um, but then we also had our environmental concerns. And so how did that all connect and how could we do that correctly in a way that was supportive to the community and then also helped our environment? And so put a pin in that moment and then fast forward a little bit through, I, I had a wonderful, amazing opportunity with Galveston Bay Foundation. And then that blossomed into uh, that network of, of networks at NAAAE. And this is actually a selfie, which I rarely take selfies. So it's great that this, this happened in this moment, but it was because it was the first time I actually had walked past the White House. Um, so NAAAE is based in DC and we were right in the middle of doing our final selections in March of 2020 for the grantees that I will be talking about in a little bit. Um, and so I snapped this picture really quick. Uh, all of my trips to DC up until this point, because I had been at NAAAE for about four months, all of my trips to DC had been very quick and they were super business oriented. So there wasn't a lot of time. Um, to do a lot, but anytime I walked by anything, of course, I took pictures and um, it was a really great experience, but this was actually the day that I was leaving DC. It was March 10th, and um, as you all know, promptly everything shut down, so we're going to put a pin on that, and so when we were in Baja, we as a class selected this quote, um, and it came up organically throughout the group, and it was though the rocks may shift. And that's what we started the presentation on. And so I was thinking, gosh, these rocks are shifting and shifting and shifting. And I started thinking about experiences, lessons I'd learned, people I met, resources, and my values. And so as we all are in this, this situation, we might not think of it this way, you go through these moments and you just continuously see and feel these shifts. And you're always wondering, Am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right steps? Am I, am I meeting the right people? Am I going about this the right way? And so I recognized that. And as I recognized that, I realized that there were some things that I'd sort of picked up along the way that were really helping to shift and shape 
the focus of the work that I wanted to do and how I interacted with others. And um, it really, you know, when you when you when you're really passionate about something, you you end up doing a lot of research and you end up kind of going down the rabbit hole of just trying to figure out and pull all the things and bring all the resources in. And one of the greatest resources that I found was um, a book called Atom Atomic Habits. Put in the chat if you've ever heard of James Clare and Atomic Habits. Um, if you haven't, uh, I will also put that in the link. I actually didn't put that in the link for you all, but it is a really great resource. It's a really um, wonderful book. He also has a Thursday newsletter that goes out. It's Words of Wisdom. It's called 321. I highly recommend it. But as I read through his book and I started thinking about all the things that I had done, I recognized that a lot of things that I did working with animals was just very applicable to just general life. And so when you work with animals and you're, you're doing operant conditioning, you're looking at setting up systems to meet success. And so if you're working with that animal, you're diving in and you're, you're exploring the individual history of the animal. You're exploring the, the natural history of that species. And if you're working on behavior management, you are essentially building a system to reach the end goal. So if the end goal was a voluntary blood draw, which is, as we all know, way less stressful than a restrained blood draw, then you would build these steps to meet the goal of doing that successfully. It's better for you, it's better for the animal most like, most importantly, but it's just a much easier process, but it takes steps to get there. And I started thinking about systems in that way as well. So I dove into research and then I grasped onto the community engagement guidelines that we have at NAAAWE, which I will also be mentioning as well, um, a little bit towards the end. And so these three, points, as you can see, there's, there's a little bit of a correlation. There's a lot of threes in this, but these three points started coming together. Um, and one of the greatest quotes that I like from the Atomic Habits book by James Clare is, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level, level of your systems. And so as I started digging into it, and I stepped into this new role at NAAAE, I recognized that I wanted to change the system of how I approached the work that I was doing. I was no longer working directly with communities on the ground as an environmental educator, but I was in this different role as, as being a grant funder, um, a grant manager, a project manager. And so I was excited because I had this different scope of, of impact, but I also found that the system that I was developing through my zoo and aquarium work, through my community work, through the work with Galveston Bay Foundation, it was this cultivation of changing systematically how I did things. And so EE Blue, which is our partnership with NOAA, we launched uh, the Watershed STEM Educational Partnership for 21 CCLC sites. Um, and I can dive into this a little bit more if you have questions towards the end, but essentially we selected 29 organizations. Actually, Alicia and uh, Citizens Environmental Coalition is one of the grantees that I work with. So look at how those networks just connected. Um, and we, uh, these, these grants are funded, funded in 17 states and we are connected to 91, 21 first century community learning centers. And so this grant essentially is a partnership with these community learning centers and they are um, serving underserved students in the after school space and they're bringing STEM watershed education into the scope of the programs for these 21 CCLC sites. So it's connected to over 200 professionals and it has this potential reach of reaching thousands of students and families connected to this work. And so for me, you know, this, this island girl at heart that is just, you know, so thankful for this opportunity, but also seeing this as such a great opportunity to make impact and, to, and to, to help support the field. I dug into all of these things that I've spoken about up until this, this point. 
And as you can see on this, this picture right here, I mean, the grantees range from Alaska to Hawaii, to the Gulf, to the Great Lakes, um, to the West Coast. And so this is a lot of reach. This is a lot of amazing programs that are built on, you know, sound NOAA evaluated uh, program implementation. It's wonderful, amazing organ organizations that have incredible educators like all of you. And it's these this partnership of 21 CCLCs coming into a new space in learning watershed STEM education as a potential program that they can have at their sites. And so I really wanted to make sure that as the project manager for this, I pulled in all my resources. So very similar to what many of you and your teams have done when COVID hit, you looked at everything that you had and you started to pull pieces together. Um, I would love to see in the chat, if you are an educator that has been adapting during COVID, what are some of the things that you did to adapt? Um, many of you had to move into virtual space. Many of you maybe have, had never made video tutorials or even had a Zoom account. I mean, raise your hand if you never had a Zoom account until COVID. Um, if you put kits together, that is, is something that maybe you never had done before. And so you pulled all the pieces together through listening to your community, through finding the needs to basically continue your work. And that's essentially what I did at the level that I was at. I used resources within NAAAE, the Community Engagement Guidelines. Um, I dug into research. I did webinars. Um, how many webinars have you been on at this point? I think we've all probably been on at least, I don't know, maybe 100 to 200 webinars at this point. Um, I thought and I asked questions. Uh, the previous presenter talked about being curious. You know, us in the environmental education field, we feel very curious. We want to know how things work. We want to figure out how to do it better. We want to figure out how to communicate things. Pulling all your resources and your support, reaching out to your friends within the field, collecting feedback through surveys, analyzing reports you are getting in, listening and taking notes and having conversations. Um, raise your hand or put in the chat if you reached out to your EE friends and asked what they were doing during this time. Um, and so pulling and putting all these pieces together was a part of building those systems. And one of the resources at NAAA that I would love to touch on for you all is the Community Engagement Guidelines for Excellence. Uh, this is a project that has been around for several decades. Um, it is a, an amazing tool. All of the guidelines are amazing, but particularly for this audience, it is an amazing tool because it is built on sound research and it is built through practitioner lenses. And so thousands of practitioners have been a part of bringing this together. Amazing researchers and evaluators and collaborators have been a part of this particular document. And the five key characteristics is looking at these things. Is it community centered? When you're going into the community with your programs, is it community centered? Is it based on sound environmental education principles? That is, is super key. Is it collaborative and inclusive? Is it oriented towards capacity building and civic engagement? And then also, is it a long-term investment in change? So I encourage you all to definitely dig into these resources. They are free. Um, Alicia just put in, or I think Emily just put in the PDF for the guidelines. You can download it free digitally. And um, as uh, Alicia just put in the chat, TAEE, -E, which is our Texas, our state affiliate for NAAAE, they're doing workshops and they're going to hopefully um, have these guidelines available and dive into it. So stay tuned and connect for that as well. But this is, is such a great resource. I have a hard copy that I actually got through um, an NAAAE conference before I was even on board at staff. And it is bookmarked, it is highlighted, it's filled with case studies, it's filled with resources, links, um, it's filled with so many different things and it really breaks down this process in a way that will help you and your teams truly connect to your, your community and enhance your programs. So I will definitely make sure that you all have that available. So when I reflect onto my own experience and kind of where I was, I decided to do the same sort of approach 
with the community engagement guidelines, the same sort of approach that I took when I worked for zoos and aquariums, where I, when I volunteered with community organizations, when I um, was a part of Galveston Bay Foundation, I decided, you know, I know that the community is, is not the community that I'm used to working in, but a community is a group that is, is centered around the same sort of um, things, right? So looking at this EE Blue grantee group as a community. And as soon as we launched this grant opportunity and we had everybody selected and contracts were signed, that was June 1st. And I worked very closely with NOAA and our internal NAA team to, to essentially build this new system of how I supported the grantees, how I was going to go, how I felt um, impacted to go about connecting with them. And so as a, as it's weird to consider myself being like a, in the funder role and the project management role, I'm still getting used to that and digesting that, but listening to the community and and making it community centered i essentially took the same community engagement guidelines and applied everything that i learned working in communities and working alongside communities to this new community that i was um, uh, leading in a way and so i developed lots of different resources for them i developed a google group where we have um, communication going constantly i sent out you know, a few surveys to find out how people wanted to communicate, what was the most helpful. We have a Google folder where I have everything from resources to protocols to forms um, listed. So it's a quick access way for people to dig into things that they might need for the grant or ways to support their work. We have a Google calendar where I list everything from reporting dates to webinars um, to things that are happening connected to uh, the grant a jam board. Um, so that, that was the video that was playing on the little monitor here. Basically just um, having an open space for people to throw thoughts and links and talk amongst themselves or just kind of put pins in things. Uh, one of the things that I developed is called a coffee and chat, which is just an informal space for um, any grantee to come on uh, we, I try to host four to five per month, which seems like a lot, but I'm recognizing has been super valuable in this process. Um, and it's just an open space where we can talk about how people are adapting. Um, what are they doing that's working? What's not working? Where are they having troubles? Um, they can ask questions amongst each other because there's so much expertise within these educators to have that open space time to talk about things. Um, I, we've also put together various professional development opportunities, webinars for them to support them in their work. And a lot of it is centered around the things that they have asked for. So again, making sure that this is community centered, making sure that it's inclusive. Um, in, in December, I did one-on-one. -on -one. So with 29 grantees, I set 30 minute windows for them to just be able to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, obviously my door, my phone, my Email is always open for them to access if they have any questions or need any support. But this was just one of those times where we actually took the time to um, make sure that that everything was going okay and they didn't have any pressing questions. And we just had that space and time to do that. And a lot more. Um, a big thing that I thought was really important was communicating this amazing work, but also communicating the challenges because we're all in a very real space right now. And so providing them the opportunity to sign up to do a blog on our NAAA site, where they basically talk about what they've done, how they've adapted in efforts to support others in the field. Um, so I can, I also have links for that as well. But I really found that once I dove into this, that it was pretty much the same. And that kind of took me back to the work that I did in, in grad school with, with where, where it started with Baja, um, this cultivation. So when we want to impact change and we want to, to really dive into our journey, no matter what that looks like, you know, there's a cultivation that happens internally. And then there's a cultivation that will start to happen within your organization or your group or your community. And then then that will essentially waterfall into your cultivation and the outside community or your external groups. 
And so I started to see this trend. And by applying this to this grantee group, I found a lot of success and has, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from the educators that are, are doing their best to adapt to a very hard environment in terms of, of navigating their program implementation. And so just like you, there are many of you that have done a lot of these things. I saw a lot kind of popping up in the chat, um, everything from putting together kits to um, creating professional development for teachers online, um, getting kids out safely in spaces where there, you know, there's masked up protocols or doing the research to find that a, a pool um, is one of the most safe places during COVID because there's not a lot that can transfer due to chlorine, um, creating modules. Uh, one of my grantees in Hawaii actually developed um, a land uh, changing uh, activity through Minecraft. And he is playing around with 360 um, coral reef exploration video footage and just all of these um, innovative ways as educators that you all have probably also either connected to or know somebody that has uh, just dove into changing the system of how we are doing things in the environment that we've been handed. And as, as I know, and you all know, that's what educators do. We adapt, we support, we evaluate, and we rinse and repeat to make a better impact or to change um, you know, the way that things are approached for the better. And so it's been really amazing and just so powerful for me to experience this from this level, but then also to hear the stories from the grantees or um, groups that I'm connected with through NAAAE or my, the outside organizations that I'm connected to that everyone is on this exploration to really changing their systems in efforts to meeting goals that they had and even some new goals. And so bringing it all around full circle. Um, the reason why I named this presentation, though the rocks may shift was because it was a part of a quote. And the end of the quote is though the rocks may shift, you're still on the right path. And so I hope that through this presentation that you all see how these moments are connected to impact this amazing opportunity for change. And even though it's challenging, we all have the tools and the resources to do the things that we need to do and, and set up the systems that we need to set up to support our communities, to you know, empower our students, to connect the dots for our network. And so I hope that as we round this very long year that we've had from March, 2020 to March, 2021, and we move into this new, um, I don't like to say the word new normal, but we, we, we move into this new time um, of getting back to the way that things were. Um, we also recognize that there are some things that we can pull and take with us um, that we learned over the year. There are some things that we recognize was not working and things that we might need to reflect upon and shift and change. But as you are moving forward, you are on the right path. And so I hope that through this presentation that that brings a little bit of that to you and, and connects the dots to you. I'd love to share some ways for you to connect with NAAAE. Uh, you can always, you can become a member, but a lot of things on our site is free. Um, there are student memberships available. So if you're connected to students, uh, feel free to pass that on. It is a wonderful website that is filled with so many resources. I still haven't dug into every single resource because there's so much to support the field. You can connect to TAEE, which is our Texas state affiliate. Um, Alicia is on the call and she is amazing. I'm so thankful to have her be a part of not only my network, but a part of my friend, my, my community group. Um, she is just amazing. And I'm so thankful that I get to continue to work with her in various spaces. Um, so you can definitely connect there. And then EE Pro, which you can actually join EE Pro for free. It is an online networking hub where there are various discussion focuses and you can dive into 
research and evaluation, behavior change. We have a new one for young and emerging professionals. It basically takes all the different focuses of the field and it breaks it into discussion groups. The moderators are usually experts within the field, some amazing people that are doing and have done amazing work in the field of EE that you can connect to. And it's just another great space for you to connect with other environmental education providers. So hopefully you all will have a chance to explore that at some point. And then really quickly, I'd love to share an exciting opportunity uh, with you all. We just launched literally this week. So you are probably one of the first few groups to maybe hear about this. We haven't, we've done some slow promotions, but this is um, a fellowship that will be um, available for anyone to apply for. It's called the Sea Change Fellowship. It's building leadership in civics civic engagement and environmental education. And this is just a wonderful opportunity for you to uh, grow your network, for you to get some really amazing professional development and also be a part of this collaborative and inclusive environment in terms of connecting civic engagement to environmental education. So we also have a link for that that will be in the chat. So if you're interested, it is open to all. There is no age limits. Um, you, we, we encourage you to apply for it if you, if you uh, so feel led to. So really exciting opportunity. And then I just want to go ahead and close out with this quote that I really love from Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and speak through it, but feel free to read along. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one destiny affects all indirectly. And so I hope today I know it was a little bit of a raggedy journey, but I, I hope that through this journey, you all know that you are amazing educators, that you are doing all the things you can to advance the field and to make the world sustainable for all. And even though we have been through a lot of really hard things this year and the rocks have shifted, you are definitely on the right path. So I will, um, I just want to thank you all for just being you and being amazing. I am so thankful for this time and this space with you all. And I hope that uh, you reach out and connect. I've also put my uh, email address in there for you as well as uh, the, with the PDF of the slides. But I'm really um, thankful for this opportunity to share this time and space with you. So I will stop sharing. Thank you. And um, one question that came in was uh, NW, NWAEE seems to have a staff that is more reflective of its diverse audiences than many other national level organizations like NSTA and ASTC. Um, are there any insights as to why that is? Well, I think that, you know, NAAAE, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. So NAAAE has been around for a long, long time. Um, a lot has to do with, I, I feel, being so connected into the field and being a network of network. NAAAE has served as this backbone, this convener. And I think through that, just listening to others, I think, I think personally, this is my personal opinion, I think that that has really helped with developing this more advanced approach to how things have been done. So the strategic framework and the plans and the things that I had been connected to as a member of NAAAE was way ahead of kind of the movement that we're seeing right now, which is great. We're, we're all great that this movement is happening and things are shifting and changing for the better, but NAAAE has been doing this work, this DEI work, this DEIJ work for a long time. Um, it is something that Judy Browse, our executive director, has been really involved with and, and super passionate about. And, you know, as we know, leadership trickles in and, and brings their, their thoughts and their, their um, passions and their expertise. And I think that it's a, it's accumulation of um, the staff that's been hired, people that are on the board, and listening to the community of environmental educators. Um, so I think that that is... is 
potentially, in my opinion, the reason why it does look very different and it will continue to always look different because I think that that's something that has always been a big part of the mission and the vision for the organization. Thank you. And the uh, next question um, was, what network building activities have been successful for you in the last year without face-to-face -face interactions and conferencing? For me personally, or just things that I've noticed? Both. Both? <laughs> um, I think that you know there's some there's some things that we quote unquote used to do that maybe we don't do as frequently anymore because we do have these really great platforms where we can jump on like social media and you know text messaging you can send things really quickly but i've been pressing upon myself to set up times to have calls you know walk and talks with people um if it's somebody that is a colleague and it's it's sort of more of a professional thing like bringing it down to a conversation i think sometimes we we think we have to have an our agenda and everything just like super professional and like, there's space and time for that but i think you know looking at simple things like writing a card like i actually have a card right now that i'm mailing off to a colleague um getting back into you know mailing things off or um just setting up a time to have a call with somebody and i think that I've also noticed uh, with the coffee and chats, the grantees, I mean, it'll be a super busy week for them. And there'll be like 15 people on the call. And they're like, I know I'm, I'm zoomed out, but I had to make this because this is like my favorite space. And I think just creating those opportunities for just informal conversation that gets into brainstorming and, and just relationship building organically, providing that space and having that space really makes a difference. Um, and I think, honestly, throughout my career, that's something I've learned and, 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 and made a point to cultivate. And like the, like the network that I feel connected to is so powerful and so strong in so many different ways. And I can always think of somebody to connect somebody to. And I, I really love that. I really be, love somebody reaching out and being like, I have this issue or this challenge, or do you know anybody? And being like, yes, I know two people. Here are these people like connect and link and go do things. Um, I think that that's so important. And I think sometimes, you know, with, with, with thinking that we have to be, you know, so stringent and professional, and yes, there's a space and a time for that, but I think that there's something to be said for being authentic and being okay with being a little bit raggedy and taking it down to a simple conversation or a simple, hey, you wanna grab some coffee and let's distance walk at a park. And you know, when the pandemic changes, what, what, does, what does that look like? You know, Maybe we make a little bit more effort um, to have just some of those informal conversations and brainstorming spaces. And I'll definitely be more appreciative about connecting with people after all of this. Um, I think I'm going to ask one last question. We're almost about out of time, but um, as someone who has gone from the program role to a funder role, what are your big learnings to share with the program folks who are looking for funding and what stands out to you now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so two things. So first, for, for my role in for, in for being in this role right now, one of the things that I see myself as is a bridge because I have most of my professional experience in being a program implementer and educator. And I want to pull that across to leadership, to opportunities where I'm in the room with other grant funders to talk about the realities of the things that educators deal with. Um, you know, oftentimes there's deliverables and there's shifts and there's requirements and, you know, sometimes it's not really known that like the educator is doing all the things like running the grant, doing the programs, evaluating, and it's, it's a lot. And they're always having to seek funding. And so where can I bring my experience in to have that conversation? And then vice versa, um, you know, things that I learned in this role that definitely would have helped me as, you know, an EE provider, um, is just learning how to tell my story a little bit better and really connecting and asking questions. Um, 
every person that I've met in a leadership position or a grant funded position, they're open doors to ask questions to. So feel free to reach out, dive into your networks, explore different paths and, and find stronger partnerships so that you can go farther together. Um, I think sometimes we often think we have to kind of do all the things, but there's so many groups doing such amazing work. Like how can you collaborate on a grant? How can you collaborate on a program? How can you bring in resources to support two or three organizations as opposed to just one? And working together in a way that's efficient um, is, is helpful. I mean, you, the, the, the African proverb um, that I love is, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And I think that within our field, that is something that we are recognizing needs to be a little bit more at the forefront. And so lessons learned in both sides. And I see that it, it's slow, like that bridge is slowly becoming a little bit more distinct and formed and people are starting to kind of go back and forth on it, which is great. And like Alicia just said in the chat, um, and she, maybe she can speak to this a little bit, um, hair, which is uh, the, 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 I guess that would be like the Avengers, the EE Avengers force that Alicia has done here in Houston is basically doing that. It's bringing everybody that's an EE at the table to have discussions, to share, to collaborate, to build their partnerships so that we can do more impactful work without spreading ourselves so thin and competing so much for resources. And so um, I think you know, as we continue on this journey, if we can continue to just build that bridge and, and, and have those conversations back and forth, we're going to see some just impactful, huge projects and things just sort of lift off the ground as we do this together. All right. Well, I think that was all the questions. And I think we're out of time as well, unless anyone has any last question they'd like to ask. Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It was very enjoyable. Thank you all so much for having me. Please stay in touch. I'd love to, to check in and meet with all of you at any time and definitely check out those links and feel free to reach out if you need anything. Thanks, Tanaya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.